My name is uh, Tanya Bikai Saab. I'm a professor of oncology at the Mayo Clinic and uh, consultant uh, in Mayo Clinic on our campus in Arizona. Gives me great pleasure to go through uh, uh, essentially the successes and failures in drug development in advanced pancreatic cancer. We'll talk about uh, what's working, what's not, and most importantly, you know, focus about uh, some of the uh, targeted strategies and and how we're uh, unraveling uh, essentially uh, one by one what we think are the Achilles heels of uh, of this uh, this cancer. So first, this is uh, these are my relevant financial disclosures. Just uh, to to go through a background, uh, in pancreas cancer, uh, you know, at least in the United States, but worldwide, is 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 one of the uh, top ten cancers in terms of incidence. Uh, but when it comes to mortality, it's actually the third leading cause of of you of cancer death in the United States. And if we continue on that track, it may become the second leading. Although I'm pretty optimistic that actually we're gonna get there. Uh, uh, it's it's slow, but but ensure progress. Uh, and it's important to understand also that the early diagnosis of this cancer certainly helps with enhancing the likelihood of survival. Unfortunately, most pancreas cancer patients present later in their diagnosis rather than uh, earlier. And so it's important to you know uh, 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 develop good strategies across the spectrum of stages for this type of cancer. Now, the standard uh, for uh, advanced chemotherapy for most patients had been, uh, I'm sorry, for advanced stages had been chemotherapy. Uh, uh, and, and a couple of regimens that have been used in, in actual practice, Volferinox and uh, Napaclitaxel and Gemcitabine. And a real-world analysis suggests that they're very similar in terms of their outcomes. So the preference is to the, to the pr physician and and the patient in terms of discussion, they have different uh, levels of toxicities. Um, yeah, there are certainly modifications that are important to consider uh, for uh, patients undergoing these types of chemotherapy. When, and the goal is to actually minimize the risks of toxicities while not compromising necessarily efficacy. So with Fulferinox, for example, we modify some of the dosages of the regimen we drop components of the of of the of the regimen at three to four months, especially the oxaliplatin. With uh, uh, napaclitaxel and gemcitabine, uh, we essentially uh, uh, do uh, uh, modifications by skipping day, day eight. Now there are two studies: one uh, we published uh, a while ago, and another one from MD Anderson confirming the same. That if you skip day eight, you do great in terms of the toxicities without losing. Uh, uh, losing efficacy. So that's good news. You know, we want to make life better and longer for all our patients. Another uh, agent that's uh, that's available uh, uh, in, um, in in clinic now is, a, is an agent called liposomal uh, irinotec. And so it's essentially, you know, a, a, a liposome, which is essentially a fat fecicle that contains loads of the chemotherapy agent called irinotecan. And when we look at that load, uh, essentially it carries 80,000 molecules of the active drug uh, when it hits the cancer cell or the tumor. I'm sorry, not the cancer cell, but the tumor. Uh, the vessels around the tumor actually are, are relatively uh, tight. Uh, so this goes slowly through those blood vessels and squeezes in uh, some of these molecules into the cancer, and it does that for a whole week. It actually, circulates around, uh, and it's it's at least theoretically supposed to in enhance the kill of cancer cells uh, while uh, uh, cutting down on the risk of toxicity or maintaining toxicity for a higher load. And we've looked at all these uh, agents, you know, following uh, the first line of defense, looking at second line defense. Uh, and what we found essentially is that those that carry irinotecan and specifically liposomal irinotecan, so that fat vesicle, uh, these tend to do much better uh, than uh, what has been used in the past with oxaliplatin. One of the things about pancreas cancer that has been uh, 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 significantly problematic is 
we've we've had a lot of studies over the last two decades that continue to come back negative. So we have few positives, thankfully, uh, and we have more positive. We'll talk about more of the positives that continue to come as we refine selection of patients. But in most of the studies that have unselected, so have not selected for a genetic marker or biomarker, the studies have actually continued to disappoint us. Uh, now, there is uh, one, one promising uh, study that now is in phase three, and we reported the results of this um, uh, uh, a while ago. And it's essentially looking at using this liposomal antiquin and adding it uh, to 5 fluorouracil and oxaliplatin. Uh, and essentially, the first uh, uh, stage of, of development looked promising enough, and that led us essentially to the phase three, uh, which has completed, and we hope, uh, that ultimately uh, this uh, this will uh, uh, read out uh, end of this year. So I want to move on to the most exciting component of what is being done in pancreas cancer. Uh, and that's looking more and more at the genetics, the genetics of the patient, and as it links to the genetics of the target cancer cell, and then the targeted therapies. So when we look at uh, uh, pancreas cancer, there's actually a lot under the surface uh, than uh, we, we think. And there's a lot of targets that can be identified. Now, that doesn't mean that every one of those targets, genetic alteration, is actually uh, uh, targetable. So the fact that they're present doesn't mean that we can go after them effectively unless we do the studies prospectively, which we're going one by one. I can promise you that, that Every one of those, and I'll show you at the end, uh, two large endeavors that are going on that are specifically targeting uh, these different alterations. But one of the targets of, of high interest, high prize, is what we call DDR def defective or HRD. Uh, it has different names, different nomenclatures. So that includes the BRCA1, the BRCA2, the PALB2, the ATM, ATR, and, and, and others, mutational signatures. These are reported to be present between 15 and 25% of patients. So almost, uh, almost uh, one out of five patients will have essentially an alteration that would essentially make the DNA of the cancer cell, this is what these are, makes the DNA of the cancer cell unable to repair itself. So if you actually hit the DNA of the cancer cells, it has no capacity to repair itself. And so that's the Achilles heal uh, of that cancer cell that we can take advantage of through a variety of different agents such as uh, 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 the platinum, so cisplatin, oxaliplatin, the topoisomerase inhibitors, another form of chemotherapy drugs that also includes the nanoliposome or the liposomal antiquin we just talked about, and PARP inhibitors, importantly, and we'll talk a little bit about those as well. All these, you know, are, are, are complementary in that, in that sense. So when we look at the therapeutic landscape for pancreas cancer, we can see that it's been quite sluggish at the beginning, although we're starting to pick up some steam. What I what I did in, in Boxton Red, essentially those, uh, 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 those uh, uh, treatment options that are essentially specifically targeted. Uh, unfortunately, the erlotinib, which is one of the first to be, to be in that category, uh, uh, failed. Uh, to produce meaningful result. It was approved by the FDA, but it unfortunately did not carry uh, 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 its weight and mostly had toxicities uh, rather than benefits, so it hadn't been used. But pembrolizumab, I'll show you a case of a patient, uh, one of the first patients actually to be treated in my, in, in my clinic and probably in the U.S. on, on pembrolizumab for MSI high and Lynch syndrome, which is done fantastic in the metastatic setting. Uh, and then Entrac fusions, and of course the BRCA1, BRCA2, with an approval with Olaparib and Germline. We'll talk also about the the fact that Germline alone uh, is 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 not necessarily just the the main driver for the benefit, but somatic, meaning those that may not be linked to the inherited uh, uh, alterations in BRCA1, BRCA2 appear to actually have a very similar benefit. So that's good because that expands our capacity uh, to target those patients. 
So there are a number of uh, alterations <clears throat> that we're going after one by one. We talked about KRAS, which is a genetic alteration that's universally present in uh, in terms of mutations in, 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 in pancreas cancer in about 93 to 95%. The one we're uh, right now we're able to target is a G12C, which is about 1% of patients with pancreas cancer. And that's a subtype of, 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 of a mutation. There are other subtypes of mutation that are more common, like the G12D that we're going after as the next level. And then uh, other mutations uh, such as BRCA1, 2, uh, that both can be uh, inscribed in the genetics of the patients and in the genetics of the cancer or just in the genetics of the cancer. Same for BALB2. But we're also finding HER2 mutations uh, the small subgroup of patients that does not have mutations in KRAS is also very rich in targets uh, that, again, we're going on one by one. And then uh, Lynch syndrome uh, and uh, is associated with, with uh, deficiency in, in the M MMR proteins or what we call microsatellite instability high. Um, but we also find some of these uh, patients that uh, have sporadic MSII. What does that mean? That everyone... <clears throat> with uh, a pancreas cancer should uh, get their uh, uh, MMR proteins assessed and MSI status assessed uh, because if presence that leads down the pathway uh, of uh, uh, treating those patients with immune therapy. It's a small percent of patients, uh, but man, uh, when we find those, we get so excited because as you can see in some patients, we can induce a cure uh, with uh, with these IO agents. Um, you know, DNA uh, uh, deficiency uh, repair uh, with uh, with BRCA and others, uh, and then and then uh, you know other areas affecting the microenvironment of the cancer, so that environment that tends to protect the cancer and essentially uh, make the cancer less likely to be, uh, targeted by immune therapy. So a lot of these are underway. But I think, you know, it's very important to focus first on, on where we think is the most promising target, both as agents available in clinics suggest, but also how we're enhancing essentially uh, the capacity of these inhibitors to work. So uh, PARP inhibitors essentially work through two ways. Uh, to uh, uh, damage the DNA, uh, but also prevent some of the elements that uh, help repair uh, the P DNA. And so, in the presence of uh, of uh, in the in the presence of 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 these mutations, uh, the effectiveness of these uh, PARP inhibitors is significant in the sense that, essentially, as it damages the DNA. Uh, uh, the presence of these mutations, BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, PALB2, and others, uh, essentially prevent the cancer uh, cell from repairing its DNA, and therefore it enhances the cancer kill. And that's how these PARP inhibitors uh, work. Like with other cancers, such as breast and ovarian cancer, uh, what we've seen is that essentially a number of these agents uh, do have activity. The only one that doesn't appear to have a meaningful activity is an agent called viliparib, which unfortunately uh, 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 has only one of two mechanisms uh, that the other PARP inhibitors induce in cancer cells, so it ends up actually less likely to achieve a cancer kill, unlike olaparib, talozaparib, procaparib, and other. Um, and so you can see that the response rate is 0% with viliparib, but with the others, it's about 20%. And interestingly, with the rucaparib is the only uh, uh, agent that actually was looked at both in germline as well as in somatic, meaning that uh, rucaparib, unlike olaparib and, and, and talazoparib, uh, was, lo was looked at in patients who had both an inherited defect with BRCA1 and BRCA2 that ultimately led to development of the cancer and PALB2 as well versus rucaparib looked at those patients, but also added those patients where uh, this uh, alteration happens randomly in the cancer cell. So it's not linked to the genetics of the patient uh, and found that these patients tend to benefit equally well, whether they had the germline or the somatic alteration. Now that's very important because uh, 
when we look at all the patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2, that's about 2 to 3% of all patients uh, in the United States if you add PALB2. And then if we start adding ATM and others, maybe we'll get to about 5% of patients with genetic alterations that lead down uh, the pathway of developing pancreas cancer. Uh, with uh, with uh, with another two to three percent of somatics, so now we we'll continue to grow that pie from the two to three percent to about six percent, seven percent of patients who have these alterations, either germline or somatic. And then when we continue to expand, uh, uh, while including uh, you know the other uh, uh, DNA defects, uh, then then we start looking at fifteen to twenty percent. Now that's important, and I'll show you why. In, in, in the next few slides. But first, let's start with the ones where we have a lot of knowns. <clears throat> and uh, that's essentially uh, the, the BRCA uh, uh, mutation. So the first study actually that looked and got an FDA approval was the study called Polo study. It was interesting. This study actually allowed patients who had germline, so, so they, they were born, so they inherited that alterations, the BRCA1 or the BRCA2. And uh, they actually were exposed to platinum. So in this case, most of them received a drug called oxaliplatin that we know is highly effective in that group of patients. In fact, most patients actually had a great response. And then uh, those patients, after uh, at least four months on the chemotherapy, were randomized with a flip of a coin to receive either the PARP inhibitor, but they had to actually have a good response or stable disease because those that progress on a platinum are unlikely to benefit from a PARP inhibitor. So here we're picking the winners and we randomize them to what we call a maintenance of olaparib, meaning they go on the oral drug. And in this study, the placebo is the other randomization. Now, the, 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 the study was positive for its endpoint of progression-free survival, meaning delay in progression. Now, median survival, survival was not positive, and there are a lot of reasons that have been explained for that, and that's because a lot of patients, once they progress, they go back either on a platinum, which is highly effective, or they may go down to a PARP inhibitor. So that's important to keep in mind uh, when, when, when having a discussion about this trial, is that it, it did reach its primary endpoint, uh, but the survival was not much different. I, I mean, I think that brings a fair point for our patient, given the fact that, you know, olaparib may have its own toxicities as well. And I think that's why it's important for patients and doctors to have these deep discussions about, is it worth it for me to go on this agent following chemotherapy and take the toxicities, understanding that I can take, uh, I, I can take it perhaps later when the cancer progresses uh, and, and achieve the same uh, overall results on survival or does it make sense to take it a little bit earlier and delay the progression? Um, you know, most patients would, for, would, 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 would favor the latter, meaning being on the agent, but some patients actually do favor taking a holiday uh, when I have my discussions with all my patients. So I think it has to be patient specific and important to have that discussion, but it's actually pretty important to understand that these agents now, uh, and this particular agent is a first proof of principle that we can find genetic alterations in, in pancreas cancer, and we can essentially go after them. In this case, these genetic alterations were found uh, mostly as an inherited uh, uh, component, so BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, uh, germline alterations that led down that path. Another study that essentially looked at uh, another PARP inhibitor that's viliparib as I said, you know, this is an unimpressive agent, unfortunately, and, and is not going to be developed any further in this disease. But when we look at <clears throat> essentially another study uh, from the Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering Group, what it suggests essentially that an alternative to oxaliplatin is a drug called cisplatin added to gemcitabine induces about 75%, about 70 to 75% of a response in patients, and these responses tend to be quite durable. In fact, you know, in my practice, this is more the standard than fulfirinox now for patients with BRCA and PALB uh, alterations, uh, given the high response rate and the higher level of tolerability. And we published data on the fact that if you give this agent every other week instead of weekly, 
regimens, you achieve significant responses while preventing the toxicities of the regimen. Now, I want to go back to the to the concept of this HR deficiencies, uh, so homologous uh, repair uh, deficiency, uh, which essentially is uh, includes the BRCA and 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 the non BRCA elements of this HRD phenotype or genotype. And this includes both, uh, you know, inherited uh, genes as well as genes that occur uh, randomly in, in cancer cells. This is about 15 to 20 percent of all patients with pancreas cancer. Some of them are genetic, as I said, uh, inherited, and others are just random acquired. Uh, similar to ovarian cancer and, and breast cancer, what we see essentially is that that group of patients uh, tend to respond better to a certain agent, such as platinums, versus not. And you can see here that those essentially that have HRD versus no HRD, uh, when exposed to a platinum, actually they end up doing much better uh, uh, versus those that are non-HRD, both in terms of the survival and in terms of their uh, progression-free survival. So I think that's a great proof of concept. So to, to, to try to understand the genetic landscape and the genomic landscape of our patients with pancreas cancer before we take decisions on treatment. Again, that goes to emphasize the importance of uh, genetic screening, germline screening, as well as genetic screening uh, for the DNA of the cancer cells uh, simultaneously and, and very early in the treatment of our patients because that appears to essentially drive a significant benefit if we choose the right agent for our patients uh, that matches up with the genetic alterations in the tumor. Now, we uh, essentially decided to, to, to pursue the path of essentially uh, having, uh, having uh, 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 or enhancing the, 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 the capacity of these PARP inhibitors uh, to uh, elicit responses in patients with uh, pancreas cancer and other gastrointestinal cancers. Uh, and what we've been able to show that uh, when you actually add rucaparib to an agent, to, 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 to the agent that we discussed previously, the liposomal irinotecan, we can actually, at least in, in preclinical models, so in, in mice model with BRCA alterations, we can see significant synergism, meaning that in this case, you know, uh, adding one to the other uh, significantly enhances the activity, not just by adding one to one, uh, but one to one becomes five or 10. And essentially, uh, based, based on a number of, of, of parameters that we understand about the kinetics of the drug. So it's important for us when we develop drugs to understand how they behave in the body. And this liposomal iron tecan is very interesting because it seems essentially to linger around the system for a week in the blood circulation, but mostly at the tumor level. Within a couple of days, the drug is, is eliminated from the system. So the toxicities of this drug, uh, essentially, or the potential to, to, to add toxicity is minimized after day three or four. Uh, and and, and its, its presence in the blood remains persistent beyond uh, day two or three uh, to at least a week. And that's important because when we want to think about adding drugs that have the capacity to add toxicity to each other, we want to uh, add them uh, with a window of opportunity. And in this situation, the window of opportunity is after two to three days of giving the liposomal antique, and because we know it's in the system, mostly around the tumor, but it's also out of the, 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 the organs where we're likely to cause injury if we add the two. So we maximize the potential for benefit while minimizing the potential for, for toxicity. And so in this instance, we decided in our study that we developed to give essentially rucaparib on day four, so three days after the liposomal antican was administered, and we stopped a day before. So we take advantage of the kinetics of the drug, the way these interact together, so maximize their interaction at the level of the cancer cell while minimizing their likelihood to interact in normal tissue and therefore cut down on the risk of toxicity. And indeed, uh, we presented some of the early data 
at ASCO GI uh, this year. And what we were able to achieve is we were able to actually keep the dose of the rucaparib at the highest level, which was never achieved previously in any study looking at combining an effective PARP inhibitor with chemotherapy while maintaining adequate chemotherapy pressure. So with this combination, we were able to maximize the benefit of the chemo and the benefit of the PARP inhibitor and the benefit of combining the two. And in fact, we've seen some nice responses, including patients actually where you would not expect the response, meaning those that failed prior platinum. Uh, and we know those don't respond at all to PARP inhibitors. And in this case, we were able to revert some of these patterns of resistance, at least in the first few studies, because three of the responses actually previously received platinum-containing regimens. And we've had some, some, some meaningful responses. Some of them, actually, one patient now is two years uh, with intestinal cancer continuously on the treatment. Uh, so very promising uh, outcomes. And now this is being expanded into uh, pancreas cancer only, focusing both on the BRCA uh, uh, mutations, the PALB mutations, uh, as well as uh, the HRD uh, patients. Uh, another area of significant interest is what we're finding out is that although Im immune checkpoint inhibitors, so immune therapy does not appear to work well uh, in patients with, uh, uh, with, uh, with pancreas cancer, it, it does appear to essentially have a, a synergy, a level of synergy with, uh, with PARP inhibitors uh, when in the presence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And we actually have the study with an agent called niraparib and uh, a, a checkpoint inhibitor in germline or somatic BRCA1-2 and PALB2 pancreas cancer that's ongoing. We're accruing actively on this study and hopefully we'll have it accrued and completed uh, soon. So uh, the other thing I would, I would like to say that as, as I discussed that MSI high is present in pancreas cancer, maybe not as common as colorectal cancer, but it's present. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of it uh, is somatic as well as Lynch. And we can see some really meaningful responses. Here's one patient of mine. That's the first patient actually with pancreas cancer that went on pembrolizumab in the pivotal study. A uh, patient of mine uh, uh, who essentially had other cancers that are typical for Lynch, including uh, you know, colon cancer. Uh, ultimately presented with pancreas cancer that didn't seem to respond to surgery, ultimately progressed, went on chemotherapy, finally came, uh, came to us, went on the study with pembrolizumab, and after, after six months ended up with a complete response. Now, in January 2022, last time uh, uh, we saw the patient, uh, 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 she remains in complete remission, uh, pretty amazing, uh, uh, two years, six, six plus years now after, continuously in remission. Uh, so the equivalent of a cure in a disease that doesn't uh, typically respond too well to chemotherapy. Other uh, elements, including HER2 fusions, uh, and we see some really dramatic responses with an agent called Xenocytuzumab that's being developed now for this uh, subgroup of patients. Uh, we uh, see uh, a lot of responses here, more than 40% with this agent in what we call the energy fusion. Uh, this is a very uncommon target, but yet a proof of principle that we can you know, go one by one uh, finding these, these targets. Uh, another one that you know, I briefly talked about the target uh, called KRAS G12C. You know, this is one of the major drivers in pancreas cancer. We recently uh, essentially uh, uh, published uh, or presented, I'm sorry, data uh, from uh, uh, from a study called Crystal One, uh, looking at patients with pancreas cancer and other GI cancers that were uh, heavily pretreated, we've sh we've shown half of the patient actually having a response, and all of them having what we call disease control rate. And in fact, this just shows you uh, the 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 plot, the waterfall plot, and 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 uh, 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 the length uh, and the duration of response. Um, for, for this group of patients that is heavily pretreated, the toxicities end up being relatively well tolerated. And uh, this is one example of a patient who essentially had a G12C uh, with a very meaningful response, and the patient uh, continues uh, on study. So again, if you can find that target and, and go with this agent, you actually end up with a very meaningful response. There are a number of actionable findings in pancreatic cancer. In fact, 
a recent study that was published in Lancet Oncology by one of our investigators did suggest that if you can find the target and match it um, to an agent that specifically targets it, uh, that you can actually can see some meaningful responses. So we're taking this now uh, into the clinic through uh, multiple platforms, one in collaboration with Pancreatic Action Network, so PANCAN, has this Precision uh, uh, Promise Consortium, which now includes Mayo Clinic, our campus in Rochester. And it's a collaborative research effort that uh, essentially is looking at the high level targets. We also are complementing uh, this, uh, this uh, endeavor with our own uh, Mayo Clinic accrue targeted uh, uh, strategy with uh, uh, with with what we call target pank, which is an umbrella trial, and we're looking at all these low yield alterations and going one by one for these small subgroups. As I said, you know the way we're going to win with pancreas cancer is not only focus on the alterations that are more common, but also the less common alteration and chomp at the bits one by one at this cancer ultimately to move it uh, into a more positive outcome. So. I will end this with saying that every patient with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer should be offered germline testing as well as somatic tumor profiling uh, unquestionably. This is how we're gonna move the, the field forward with this disease. Thank you.